Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today it is finally time for my review of Boosh, Red Rising by Pierce Brown. This is book one in the Red Rising saga, and we read it last month in February for the start of Feb Rising, a Red Rising read-along that is going along in my channel and in my Discord. We had a live show. We had fantastic guests on that live show. Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, Pete from Ponderings of Pete, and Leslie from The Nerdy Narrative, and it was just a great discussion. I'll link it there in case you missed it. But I haven't actually gotten my review out, and so that's what I'm gonna be doing today. This review will consist of spoilers for the beginning of the book. I'm gonna really, I'm gonna give you the, the, the movie trailer of it, because if this were a movie, uh, the trailer would not just show the stuff before the inciting incident, because no one would go see that movie. So. If like a movie trailer, like what the book is actually about, like would bother you, then you know if you if you're super sensitive to spoilers, you know go in blind. But I had the inciting incident and the premise of the book spoiled for me, and it did not in any way affect my enjoyment. In fact, it probably enhanced it because I knew where it was where it was headed instead of being like super confused as I was at points. So you have been warned. Uh, it's it's going to spoil the first few chapters, really. Um, I didn't think it with it it detracted from the overall experience, but I get it if you do. So, Red Rising takes place on our world, but in the far future. One of the things I really like about this book is that they reference, they reference our world. They reference, um, they reference America. They reference the countries of Earth. But they reference even more the Greeks and the Romans. In fact, one of the things I love the most about this book is how it is laden with Greek and Roman influences. But I'll get back to that in just a second. So, it takes place in our world in the far, in the far future. The society, the... Society has been brought down in favor of in favor of the society capital S that is broken up into a caste system based on color. In fact, your color you are bred genetically different from the other humans who are a different color than you. At the very very top, we have the golds who are like 7 to 8 feet tall. They're just they're just physically and intellectually perfect in every way. And then at the very bottom, you have the Reds who are conditioned to be kind of manual labor. Like uh, Darrow, our main character, works in the Helium-3 mines on Mars. And he is, I mean, they are much smaller, they are much slighter, and they are at the very, very bottom of this caste system. And then there's there's other colors within the caste, like there's there's blues. Blues are kind of mid-caste, and they kind of sink into to spaceships and are like the, the, the flyers. Of, of the spaceships, oranges who are kind of like maintenance guys, you have violets who are like the creative type, like actors and artists, and then pinks which are kind of like the red light district ones. So our boy Darrow is in this mining colony and just from the beginning we see how different society is uh, when you're at the bottom of the totem pole and when you're at the top. And Darrow soon realizes that the golds are really just kind of giving um, him and his reds uh, the illusion of being able to kind of like rise up. They're broken up into Greek alphabet like clans and one of the Greek alphabet clans like always wins like the prize for having mined the most helium even though Darrow ensures that it was them they still don't get it. And so so, you know, he just realizes that it's lame, it's not fair, but it's his wife, Eo. Darrow is 16, Eo is the same, these are kids. She realizes that Darrow has it in him uh, to change the world. She dreams of a world that is more equal, that is more fair, where this caste system doesn't keep the people down, that all it takes is a spark and that, and Darrow can be the one to kind of, you know, change the world, start a revolution. And Darrow is, you know, he's a tough miner, but he's, you know, he, he, no, he doesn't have any, he doesn't have any of that. A timid guy, doesn't want to lose his wife, doesn't want any of that. But then they go to a, a, a terraformed garden and they're not supposed to be there and they're arrested. And rather than kind of face their punishment, Eo, she starts singing this song that is well known for being a rebel song. It's called the Reaper Song. And the arch governor of Mars, uh, a guy named Nero Augustus. He's the gold. He's the goldest of the gold. Just in charge of the whole planet. He makes sure she's hanged. Darrow himself has to yank on her feet because the gravity is low. So we have to yank their feet in order for their necks to snap. And Eo dies. And Darrow just kind of loses his mind. And so that's really that's really the inciting incident. Is the wife uh, is Eo's death. 
And so the rest of the premise of the book is about Darrow infiltrating gold society. And he is going to try to fulfill EO's dream by bringing down the society from the inside. But to do that, he's got to live, act, learn like a gold so he can take them down. And that's a super cool premise. Now, this book is written in first person present tense which is my least favorite of all the persons and tenses. I don't like present tense in general, and I also don't like first person just in general, which is weird because I love the great coats and they're in first person. But normally I would prefer third person. And so that the first hundred pages or so were kind of hard for me. Um, all the way through the inciting incident and what happens after it, it, the, the writing style feels very, it feels very noirish. If you've read like a noir novel, these really short choppy sentences like Saturday, 11 a.m got called down to the market street, someone murdered, that kind of stuff. It's very like these short clipped sentences, but without the, the typical like extended metaphors that you see in noir fiction. And so it was just really choppy and really jarring and kind of like just hard to read. And it also went very fast. Uh, so that was really good, the pace of it. But because the writing is felt just so bare, I missed a couple things uh, a few times and I had to go back and like reread them like, oh, okay. So it is, it was sometimes confusing just because of how sparse the prose was. Now, as I said before, this thing is laden, laden with classical references. And that's the part that I like. There are, there are praetors, there are laurels, all the, the naming convention of all the golds is from from antiquity. Uh, as I said, the, the arch governor of Mars is named Nero Al Augustus. We see Cassius, we see, we see a Titus. Um, Darrow uh, takes the last name Andromedus. And the Golds are constantly referencing uh, the Greeks and the Romans, and, and it's the Spartans especially, like the training that Golds go through is called a goge, just like the uh, just like the training the Spartans went through because they believe in being just above. A lot of Red Rising for me at its core is a treatise on power and what power is, what you can choose to do with power, and at the same time, what you can choose to not do when you have that power. And so I really love the way that it explores. It explores what power means, like what raw power is. Control, is it control over someone? Is it getting people to follow you willingly? Is it fear? Is it love? Is it friendship? Is it like, is the, is the true purpose of power to control others? When you have power, is it more uh, are you stronger for striking down those that oppose you or are you stronger for showing them mercy? And it's just, it's just fascinating. Nero himself is a fascinating character and his beliefs and power are just so different as we watch these other characters in this book. So you probably have heard Red Rising described as the Hunger Games in space and there is a little bit of that. So the entire second part of, or the entire like, like back 300 pages of this book is it's, it, I mean, it's essentially the Hunger Games, but instead of like individuals just trying to wipe out each other, it is houses playing war games. And I love war games. I love anything that, that deals with war games and strategy. And Pierce Brown, it's so very obvious that he studied, uh, he studied these, these old wars and, and battles and battle tactics, because that was one of my favorite parts in this book is watching the houses scheme against each other and what tactics they're going to use, like what betrayals, what ambushes. Oh, it's just, I love that part of it. Now, and, and, and it just feels much more murdery than the Hunger Games. Like, yeah, people died, but there are many more people in what's called the Institute than there were in the Hunger Games. So like the, the, the death toll rises even higher. And even as the Golds are co-opting the Ancients, like you, you just feel icky because like we see that in, like that happens in our world where uh, like terrible human beings kind of co-opt those, those ancient civilizations as like they would support my, my horrifically like racist cause. And it's like, no, they won't. The Romans would literally just stab you in the face. They would not be about your dumb crap, I promise you. And so you just feel like a little squick uh, when they're just like, yes, we will be just like the Romans and the Greeks. And, and it's just like, Douchebags have been co-opting the Romans and the Greeks 
for centuries. Douchebags gonna be douchebags. And another thing that I like is that we do see that even among the hierarchy of the colors, like there's hierarchy among the hierarchy. Even the golds kind of have a hierarchy. There's there's the peerless scarred, which are like these 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 are the battle hardened top peak of the gold society compared to one of Darrow's comrades, Severo, who is who is much smaller and so is kind of treated uh, much worse by the rest of the golds because he doesn't meet that 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 physical and mental uh, stature that the golds have kind of bred into their society of what they they consider uh, valuable. They the the golds that they consider most valuable to society. And so as these kids are in this institute training, Pierce Brown does a really great job of humanizing the golds who we despise because of freaking Nero. Like what a douchebag. So we hate the golds, but as Daryl interacts with them, we see that they are also human. They may be the pinnacle of evolution, but they still have feelings and friendships and loyalties and they they still hurt and and they even cry and we see that even the golds as as harsh and as cruel and calculating as they are they have to be conditioned to be that way even the golds aren't born being complete and utter tools they've got to be conditioned into their their, their their superiority that they feel. And so I really like the the place that kind of Brown puts us in being like, well, but no, the goals are terrible. Oh, we freaking hate them. But also, man, I like that guy. And so even among this meritorious society, because that's the whole point, the whole point of the society is to have a merit-based system. But Humans are humans, like no matter what the system of government, no matter what they have changed in the society, no matter how their, their bodies have been altered uh, through this ge genetic modification and everything, humans are still humans. And despite the fact that everything's supposed to be, everything's supposed to be meritorious, we see politics. And good gracious, if politics just doesn't poison every single thing it touches in the real world and in fantasy worlds. And so, so it's just like the golds are supposed to have be the next evolution, the transcendence of human beings. And yet they're really just people, but they're big. They're big people. Another small thing that I really, really like that you don't see too often. I've seen it before, but it's not as common as I think it should be. Brown defines class based on the language they use. Reds talk differently than the golds. And, and I really like this, just the small distinction that certain words wouldn't be said in certain society. Like, like if, you give, if you say certain words, if you talk in a certain way um, and use certain slang, people will definitely know you're not from this specific area or this specific caste uh, or this specific family because the, uh, these people don't talk like that. They don't use words like that. And so I really like that. I've seen that before, but I, I really like when authors do that. And so this is a very, very, very fast paced book. I really like it. Um, there's a lot of info dumps. Info dumps don't bother me, but if you don't like info dumps, uh, <laughs> there's a ton in here as he, as he does his kind of, his kind of world building here. And I think one of the most interesting things about the society is about how, it, how the golds talk about the death of democracy, how democracy was a cancer on on Earth society. They call it the noble lie because they said under under Athens, the first and only true democracy where, where every man had a vote, especially after Pericles expanded it to pretty much every citizen of Athens, the golds are like, yeah, I mean, that's a cute, theory like it's nice to believe that everybody is created equal and that this guy is just as good as that guy but the concept the goals are operating on is are they really like this guy isn't necessarily as good as this guy at doing something maybe this guy's a moron and this guy's super smart so the golds believe that this guy deserves was born in a higher place than this fool and so that, that's why they call democracy the noble lie. Like, oh, it's great intentions for believing that, uh, that everyone was created equal. But in reality, are they? And really anyone looking at true democracy can kind of understand where, where Nero is coming from in the fact that democracy was a real, uh, created some real problems for ancient Athens. And this is because most of the populace wasn't super educated. And also, 
as we have all seen time and time again throughout history, mobs are easily manipulated. So if you have the common man um, who is, you know, the common man is common. But if the common man can vote on everything, you really don't even have to worry about anybody else. You just have to find someone who's a good enough speaker to stir up the mob. And so really, really then you have a society controlled by one person, the demagogue. And this is really what ancient Athens was like. Athenian democracy was incredibly prone to being stirred up by demagogues. And once it was, it just made horrible decision after horrible decision. And if you know anything about the Peloponnesian War, you know this to be true. So I really like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, like, it's a gross concept to be like, to think that people are acting on the fact that people are, some people are born better than others. Because we like to think of, we, because we like to think of ourselves as better than that. We're above that. We don't, we don't, think some people are inherently worse than others, but the gold society does. Now, some things I didn't really enjoy about this book, again, I've talked about the writing style. The inciting incident happens really quickly. We don't really get to know Eo at all. She's more of a plot device, in my opinion, than she was uh, like his wife. And so his whole motivation to get revenge for Eo, I mean, it just wears kind of thin. Like bringing down the goals, I'm okay with that. That makes sense. But like, like, but more because society is broken, not because, you know, getting revenge for EO. Like, there just wasn't a chance to really build up that relationship. Now, the relationships between Darrow and the other golds is really, really good. Like, I love some of the relationships, some of the friends and the enemies and the betrayals. Uh, Darrow's relationship with Cassius and Severo specifically are really, really interesting. And, and uh, one of those relationships is really, really good. And one of those is very, very, oh. Just, it's it's almost heartbreaking. And so that is the characters and the interaction between uh, really these kids who are all trying not to die. They're trying to band together and win while also you know, not dying themselves. So I thought those relationships were really, really well done. There are a ton of twists and betrayals and reversals. And there's some kind of plot points that I'm like, really? Like, really? Like, how, how would that happen? Like how would everyone not have just have been like mowed down and killed? Like what is stopping people from murdering these people doing this? So there's some kind of like, uh, suspend your disbelief. But overall, I really, really enjoyed this book. On the Kingfin approval system, I give this book an excellent. Um, I really, really enjoyed it after the first 100 pages, like once, once we got to the Hunger Games part, because uh, the War Games were my favorite part by far. I know some people much preferred the first part of the book. And I get it, it just, that just was not my experience. And out of five stars, I give Red Rising four stars. I understand why this book isn't for everyone. Like, uh, I know that a bunch of people have read this book and then kind of uh, DNF the series after it, or some people didn't even get through it. Um, I am actually almost through Golden Sun, a book I like much, much more uh, in some ways. There are some things about Red Rising that I miss, and there are some things that I just really enjoy about Golden Sun, but I see why everyone says once it hits Golden Sun, it is gone to the moon, Alice. And so we will actually be having our live show show on Golden Sun this Sunday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And my my uh, co-host for that live show will be Joanna uh, Vish from Books with V and Charmaine. So please, please check that out and hear us talk about Golden Sun, which is so good. So that's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. As always, information about my Patreon and my Discord is down in the description. And I'll see you guys next time.